Welcome to Chapter 19, The Evolution of Populations. So evolutionary theory posits that all of life on Earth is related. That is, fruit flies are related to earthworms, are related to rose bushes, bacteria, elephants, and yes, even humans. We're all related and share a common ancestor. But it has taken millions of years for evolution to elicit all of these organisms into the forms that we see today. Now, evolution is one of the five pillars of biology and is a key concept to understanding life on Earth. Now, you learned in chapter 18 that natural selection acts to promote traits and behaviors that increase an organism's chances of survival and reproduction. We call that fitness, while eliminating the traits and behaviors that are detrimental to the organism. But natural selection can only as its name implies, select. It cannot create. So we can attribute novel traits and behaviors to another evolu evolutionary force, and that is mutation. Now, mutation and other sources of variation among individuals, as well as the evolutionary forces that can act upon them, alter populations and species. And so in this chapter, we'll learn all about the evolution of populations. So our objectives in this chapter are to find the Hardy-Weinberg principle and discuss its importance, describe the different types of variation in a population, explain why only natural selection can act upon heritable traits, describe genetic drift and the bottleneck effect, and explain the different ways natural selection can shape populations. Now, while although Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace they were contemporaries of Gregor Mendel. Neither knew of the other's works or writings. In fact, Gregor Mendel published his uh, work, his experimentation with his pea plant, a number of years after Darwin published his book on the origin of species. And while Darwin and Wallace understood that individual species and populations evolved, and they understood that natural selection was the mechanism of evolution. They didn't quite understand the um, substance, that's my word, upon which natural selection acted. That came from Mendel. Now, Mendel called them discrete units. And we have since come to call them genes. Darwin and Wallace didn't, uh, didn't know about genes. Um, and that would come later with the modern synthesis. So the modern synthesis uh, was developed in the early 20th century. Genetics was coming into its own and Gregor Mendel's writings were discovered or some say rediscovered because Mendel wrote his um, stuff up, his experimentation up, and then no one really paid that much attention to it. It wasn't until the early 20th century when genetics really came about, started to blossom, that biologists began to really understand the target of natural selection, those discrete elements that Mendel described, or those, those genes. And so the modern synthesis describes how the evolutionary processes, natural selection that comes from Darwin and Wallace, can affect a population's genetic makeup. That comes from Mendel and in turn, the evolution of populations and ultimately species. And so the modern synthesis is essentially the work of Mendel, we call that microevolution, plus the work of Darwin and Wallace, we call that macroevolution, right? Macroevolution, evolution of species, microevolution, evolution of characteristics. And so you put the two of those together, we call that the modern synthesis. So let's talk about population evolution. Now, there's some terminology here that we have to deal with. You know what allele means. Allele is just a form of a gene. So tall versus short, um, two different forms of the same gene. The gene is the gene for plant height, purple versus white flowers, green versus yellow seeds. Now allele frequency, frequency is a rate. So it's a rate at which an allele appears within a population. We'll look more at that when we talk about Hardy-Weinberg. Uh, 
The allele frequency can change depending on environmental factors. And remember that natural selection will select for the most beneficial alleles, those forms of a gene that will enhance or promote an individual's fitness. Gene pool is just a sum of all alleles in a population. And then we have a couple of things going on here as far as population evolution goes. We have genetic drift, that's random change in allele frequency. It just naturally happens. There's no advantage or disadvantage to the population. It just occurs. It happens all the time. There's the founder effect. That's when the allele frequency changes in an isolated part of the population so that the alleles of the new population are different from those of the original population. We'll talk about bottleneck in a minute. And so with regard to founder effect, so here you see, this is just an example. Here you see over here on the mainland, we have this large population of ladybugs. And you got this little island over here and separated by some water. And what the founder effect says that uh, one of these ladybugs is going to make its way over to the island and then repopulate or populate, I should say, the little island. And, send, and, and then over evolutionary time, it doesn't take that long for ladybugs, the alleles or the, the genetic makeup of this population is going to be significantly different from the genetic makeup here. So that little ladybug is the founder, if you will, if you will, of a new population. That's founder effect. Okay, let's go to the video. So Professor Dave explains the evolution of populations. Um, it's a pretty good video. It's about 14, 15 minutes long. Um, worth you watching. So here's a quick check. So which one of the following can change a population's allele frequency? Your choices are natural selection, genetic drift, founder effect. And the truth is all of those are correct. Natural selection um, is going to, again, select for beneficial alleles. So definitely the allele composition of a population is gonna change. We talked about genetic drift, obviously, although it changes allele frequency or the types of alleles that are in the population. There's no benefit one way or the other to genetic drift, but it does change the allele frequency. And of course, founder effect is as a member from one population goes to another location and founds a new population, then that population's alleles are gonna be significantly different from the original population. Okay, Hardy Weinberg. So it's uh, Hardy Weinberg's principle of equilibrium states that a population's allele and genotype frequencies are inherently stable. And a population will remain in equilibrium unless some force changes them. Now, this is a theoretical idea, theoretical construct. And what it says is that if a population is large enough and there's no evolutionary forces acting on it, then that population's genotype, allele frequency, will remain stable. Okay, will not, it will not change. And what this does as a theoretical concept, it, it allows us as biologists, as experimenters, to go out and um, look at a natural population and then determine if that population is a stable one based on predictions 
by Hardy Weinberg. This will all make sense in just a second, I hope. So there are some assumptions that go along with Hardy Weinberg. Remember, this is a theoretical concept. Those assumptions are there are no forces, no evolutionary forces acting on the population. So there are no mutations going on. There's no migration. There's nobody going out of the population. There's no emigration. There's no new people, new organisms, new individuals coming into the population. There's no selective pressure. In other words, there's plenty of food. Nobody's fighting for food. There are no uh, predators. Okay, everything is cool. No pressure for or against a particular genotype. And it's an infinite population. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's um, obviously it's going to be finite, but it's not a small population. It's a large population, theoretically infinite. And so if the lower the little lowercase letter p represents one allele, remember we have two alleles, right, per gene. You learned this in um, last semester. So if you, so in the case of pea plants, right, they will have a, for the gene for height, they can have a tall allele or a short allele. They can have two tall alleles, they can have two short alleles, or they can have a mixture, right? They can ha be heterozygous for that allele. So we're going to have a tall and a short allele together. But remember, you have two genes, right? And uh, each of those sister chromatids potentially represents a different allele. So if little p represents one allele and little q represents the other allele, then the Hardy-Weinberg to begin with, the Hardy-Weinberg equation says that P plus Q equals 1. Now, 1 is the key here. So 1 is like 100%, right? So the number of P alleles plus the number of Q alleles always equals 1. Keep that in mind. So if a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then there are no evolutionary forces acting on that population. Okay, so here's kind of an example. Remember that an individual can have one of three genotypes for height in the case of pea plants. So we can be homozygous dominant, big T, big T. We can be heterozygous, big T, little t. Or we can be homozygous recessive, little t, little t, okay? Now, you can work this out by doing a simple Punnett square, right? This is the um, uh, simple monohybrid cross, where we have uh, big T there, big T there, right? That's the first parent. Little t there, little t there. So we're crossing a homozygous dominant plant with a homozygous recessive plant. And you just worked out the Punnett square. And so what you end up with here, genotype frequency or the, the genotype ratio is one to one. That is one homozygous dominant, two heterozygotes, and one homozygous recessive. And we're going to use those numbers in the Hardy-Weinberg equation. And if we think about Hardy-Weinberg, the, the equation is P plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. All right, so if we, we plug these um, alleles in, then we get big T squared plus 2 big T times little t plus little t squared. And again, Hardy-Weinberg says all of that has to be equal to 1. Now we're doing this with these particular alleles here, but Hardy-Weinberg is a generic equation, and so we can look at it this way, right? Because if, if p equals big T and q equals little t, then p squared plus 2 times p times q plus q squared equals 1. You want to remember this equation because what you're going to be doing some uh, Hardy-Weinberg um, problems or 
um, calculations, I hate to use that word because I know math scares a lot of people, but you want to remember this equation. It's very important. That's the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation, okay? And so from your book, if you look at this little um, ditty here, okay, so here is we have the parent generation and we have the phenotypes. Here is the uh, yellow P, a homozygous dominant. The phenotype is the yellow seed color. Homoz uh, heterozygous, obviously the seed color is yellow. And here is the homozygous recessive seed color is green. So the phenotypes are yellow seeds, yellow seeds, and green seeds. Now the genotype frequency, we do the little um, Experimentation, we examine the population. By the way, the population number of individuals is 500. All right, so we examine the population and we determine the genotype frequency is 0.49 or 49% are homozygous dominant, 42%, 0.42 is the frequency, or 42% is um, heterozygous, and 0.09 or 9% is homozygous recessive. Now, we want to get numbers that we can plug into the Hardy-Weinberg equation. In order to do that, we have to determine how many of the 500 individuals is homozygous dominant. Because remember, Hardy-Weinberg, we're not looking at, initially we're not looking at phenotype, we're looking at genotype. So how many of the 500 should we expect to be homozygous dominant. Well, you take your 49% or your 0.49, multiply that by 500, which is the total number of individuals, and you get 245. Now, there are two big Y alleles here. So we have to multiply this number by 2. Okay, so we're trying to determine how, how many of these big Y alleles there are in the population. So you take this number, after you calculate this number, Multiply it by 2, and you get 490. Now, we, we're looking at the big, the big allele, the big Y allele here. Okay, so how many of the 500 are heterozygous? So we take 500, multiply it by 42, uh, 0 0.42, and we get 210. Now here's the thing, there are 210 big Y alleles and 210 little Y alleles, right? And so if we're determining P over here, the allelic frequency, we want to know how many, we're trying to determine how many big Ys there are in the population, we have to take the number of big Ys over here, which is 210, add it to the number of big Ys that we got over here, and we get 700. We do the same thing on this side, all right? So to determine the homozygous recessive, it's 0 0.09 or 9%, 0 0.09 times 500 gives us 45. And there are two little y alleles, so it's 40, 45 times 2, that gives us 90. But remember, we had 210 little y's from the heterozygotes, so we have to add those together to all of the little alleles in the population, 300. So the number of alleles in the gene pool is 1,000. We have 500 individuals. Each individual has two alleles. 2 times 500 is 1,000. 
So to get the allelic frequency or the frequency of the big Y allele, we take that number, 700, divided by 1,000, just simple math here, and we get 0.7. So in our Hardy-Weinberg equation, P, little p, its value is 0.7. And we do the same thing over here. 300 divided by 1,000 total alleles gives us Q, which is 0.3. And remember now that P plus Q must equal 1. So 0.7 plus 0.3 is 1. So that checks out. Now we have our numbers, 0.7 for P and 0.3 for Q. Now on this side, um, again from your text, we're just, it says Hardy-Weinberg analysis, we're just checking ourselves, really, putting everything together. And so you determine that the value of P was 0.7, the value of Q was 0.3. Do a little Punnett square and do the cross multiplication. You can see that P squared, okay, 0.7 times 0.7 is 0.49. And 0.3 times 0.3 is 0.09. And 0.7 times 0.3 is 0.21. So we have 2 times 21 here, right, 2PQ down here. And so the predicted frequency of offspring in the second generation that are homozygous dominant for Y is 0.49. Predicted frequency of in the second generation um, F1 generation, first filial generation, is 0.42. The predicted frequency of the homozygous recessive in the F1 generation is 0.09. If you add these numbers up, to, all of these numbers up together, they equal one. Okay. So here's an example, here's a real example for you that you're going to work on. So in plants, violet flower color, we're going to call that, that allele, capital V, is dominant over white flower color. We're going to call that lowercase v. So if P equals 0 0.8 and Q equals 0 0.2, remember this is the frequency of big V, and this is the frequency of little v in a population of 500 plants, how many individuals would you expect to be homozygous dominant, big V, big V, heterozygous, big V, little v, and homozygous recessive, little v, little v? And then the follow-up question is, how many plants would you expect to have violet flowers and how many would have white flowers? Okay, so, so I'm putting together a Hardy-Weinberg review sheet for you, and this problem will be worked out in there. But this is the kind of thing that you want to be able to do in this part of Biology 102. You be able to. You should be able to work Hardy-Weinberg uh, problems or Hardy-Weinberg um, situations. So the deal here is okay. So the deal here is I've given you the frequencies of the alleles, and I just want you to tell me what the frequency of big V, big V, big V, little V, and little V, little V are a population of 500 plants. And then from that, you should be able to tell me how many flowers out of 500 have purple, or how many plants out of 500 have purple flowers, and how many have white flowers, okay? I'm gonna work this example for you in your review sheet. Okay, so this is a good little um, video from the Khan Academy, it's not very long, applying the Hardy-Weinberg principle Please watch it, okay? It's going to um, explain a lot with regard to solving Hardy-Weinberg situations.
Okay, so remember that natural selection only acts on heritable traits. And those are traits that confer fitness. And fitness is the ability to survive and reproduce. We call that fecundity. So heritability is a phenotypic variation due to genetic variation or variance. And remember, heritable traits are transferred from parents to progeny or offspring. So heritability, phenotypic variation due to genetic variance. Genetic variance then is the diversity of alleles, or the diversity of genotypes within a population. And you should know that maintaining genetic variance within a population maintains fitness of that population. And I'm sure you've all heard stories, may have seen it on uh, the PBS, Nova, or Discovery Channel about how, um, how critical the genetic fitness of wild cheetahs are because there are so few of them in the wild. And so one of the point and one of the purposes of doing breeding, cheetah breeding programs in zoos now, and what they do is they fly cheetahs around all around the world so that they can maintain genetic variation. Inbreeding is a mating, mating of closely related individuals and what happens is as, in, as individuals breed with relatives, undesirable, um, deleterious re and recessive mutations that can then come to the surface and cause physical abnormalities, cause susceptibility to disease. And that's what they're trying to uh, eliminate or certainly reduce with the cheetah breeding programs. Okay, so genetic drift, we mentioned it earlier, change in genetic variation or allele frequency due to chance. Now, this just happens and it happens just randomly by chance, okay? So genetic drift um, is described by the chance that one individual have, will have more offspring than another. So in a frog population, one male, so the idea is that one male mates twice as much as the other males. And that just happens by chance, okay? One male gets around more than the other males. So here we can see it in from your book in these um, in this population of rabbits. So we have this population and some of the rabbits are homozygous dominant for brown fur color, some of them are heterozygous and some of them are homozygous recessive for white fur color. Now, in this first generation, let's say these five rabbits reproduce. Okay, none of, none of these rabbits reproduce, only these five. But some of them are homozygous recessive, so obviously the white's gonna come out. So they, they reproduce. Remember, genetic drift uh, is the chance that one member of a population is going to reproduce more than another member of the population. So in this population of 10, these five are able to reproduce. Here's the second generation. There's your homozygous recessive coming out. But look, it's the frequency of a homozygous recessive has been reduced. Now in the second generation out of 10 rabbits, only these two are able to reproduce for whatever reason. Look, they're both homozygous dominant. So they reproduce and you end up with, in the third generation, 100% homozygous dominant, all brown fur, okay? And this just happens by chance. So that's the idea behind genetic drift, only a certain certain individuals in a population are able to reproduce over or more than other members of the population. And as that happens, see, certain alleles drift out. In this case, the homozygous recessive genotype drifts out with every generation.
And in fact, the recessive allele in this second generation, in the third generation, has drifted out altogether. Okay, that's the idea behind genetic drift. So, um, genetic drift, uh, we are, sorry, saw that. Okay, so the question here is, would genetic drift happen more quickly on an island or on the mainland? Remember our little ladybug example from before, right? Do you think genetic drift would happen more quickly on an island or on the mainland? Well, the smaller the population, the greater the chance of genetic drift. And so if you have an infinite population on the mainland, potentially, then genetic drift, um, the strength of genetic drift is going to be negligible versus if you have only five individuals on an island, then genetic drift is going to happen a lot. So the smaller the population, the greater the chance of genetic drift. And remember, with Hardy-Weinberg, Hardy-Weinberg assumes an infinite population. So the bottleneck effect is magnification of genetic drift. It can be as a result of natural disasters, catastrophes. It involves a sudden and drastic reduction of a population's genetic variance. And so here is an uh, illustration that everybody uses for the bottleneck effect using, well, what else, bottles. So here's the uh, original population, and each one of these is a genotype or an allele. The original population, if you turn it up, all of these marbles cannot go through the neck of this, the narrow neck of this bottle together, only a few at a time. And so you end up, and so we call that the bottleneck event. So you end up with just a few, comparatively, a few alleles in the surviving population versus the original population. So, so the point here is some drastic event has occurred and wiped out the original population with only a few, a handful of survivors. Now, those survivors are going to obviously start reproducing and rebuild the population, but the genotype or the allele frequency or the genetic makeup of this new population is significantly different from the original population because the types of alleles are significantly different in the surviving population. Okay, gene flow is immigration versus emigration. Immigration with an I versus emigration with an E. Im immigration is individuals coming into a population. Emigration or emigration is individuals leaving a population. So gene flow is a flow of alleles in and out of a population due to migration of individuals or gametes in or out of said population. So an example here is young male lions leaving the pride to search out a new pride with unrelated females. So once um, in a pride, once male lions get to a certain age, then the mother sort of ushers them out and they must go and find other other prides where they can then uh, breed with interested females. And so here is our little uh, ladybug example again. We're talking about gene flow. So we have population over here, population over there, obviously. And so gene flow says that some individual from this population is going to migrate to another population and start breeding with this population. So this individual that migrates over is going to bring new, new gametes, new alleles into this population. Once, once this guy starts breeding, then the genetic makeup or the allele frequency is going to change. That's gene flow. 
Okay, mutation. Um, you're familiar with mutation already. That's change to an organism's DNA. It's uh, important to population diversity. And in fact, evolution depends on accumulated mutations in order to do its thing, right? Um, natural selection chooses beneficial mutations. So mutation is the most common way to introduce novel genotypic and phenotypic variation. Remember that harmful or unfavorable mutations are eliminated from the population by natural selection. And mutations that increase the population's fitness quickly spread through the population. So other forces, natural forces, that can affect a population's genetic makeup or allelic frequency, non-random mating. This is mating between individuals through selection or non-chance mating. So Hardy Weinberg assumes random mating. In non-random mating, mating occurs through selection. Selection can be, for instance, through sexual selection. We'll talk about that later or sexual dimorphism. What is sexual dimorphism? That's a difference between either a behavioral difference or phenotypic difference between males and females of a species. Now, this is the obvious one. Male uh, peacocks have this big giant fan, beautiful fan of tail feathers. Female peacocks or peahens do not have that big fan. So there's a, a phenotypic difference there called that sexual dimorphism. And here we see a little frog, uh, looks like a green tree frog, and it's chirping or croaking. Uh, what they do is they fill this pocket under their chin with air. And they blow the air out and it makes the, the chirp or the peep or the croak. Only males do this, only males call. And so that's another difference, another example of sexual dimorphism. Oh, and so with regard to non-random non mating, what, what happens is females in frog populations, females choose males. And what females will choose are males that seem to be more fit or more able to survive and reproduce. And in the case of frogs and toads, males with the loudest call get chosen first by females because a loud call or a very deep call for toads um, sends the signal to the females that that male is stronger, is more fit, is more able to, to survive and ultimately reproduce. Obviously, in the case of peacocks, uh, the larger and the more beautiful the fan of tail feathers, um, that is a sign of fitness, right? a, f a, a sign of survivability and fecundity. Now, there are also environmental factors that can play into um, fitness or play into phenotypic variation. So environmental variance is when environmental factors affect phenotypic variance. Now, I show you this little crocodilian over here, little alligator. And what happens with crocodiles, crocodilians, and some of the reptiles is temperature, incubation temperature affects gender. So the, um, the warmer the temperature, uh, the warmer the incubation temperature, the more males will be produced. The cooler the temperature, the more females we will, will be produced. In the case of turtles, in the case of most turtles, actually the cooler the temperature, the incubation temperature, the more males are produced and the warmer, the more females. It's opposite that of crocodilians and um, some lizards. So that's where environment 
temperature, incubation temperature, affects the outcome of phenotype. And a cline here represents a geographic represents geographic variation across ecological gradient. I've shown you two different examples of humans, same species, Homo sapiens sapiens. Now here in Sub-Saharan Africa, the typical male is um, tall and very thin, and what that allows that um, phenotype to do is to radiate heat away from the body. In Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, it's very hot, so these, these individuals do not need to retain heat. So the taller they are and the thinner they are, the easier they are, the easier it will be for them to radiate heat. In the case of this inuit over here, the typical inuit is short and stocky, short and stout, like the teapot, right? Short and stocky, and they have um, um, places, more fat, stores of fat across their body. Fat is insulation. And so you see short and stout, that retains heat and lots of fat, that insulates the body. So you can see a cline or um, phenotypic gradient across geogra geography. Okay, quick check. What is the change in a population's allele frequency due to chance? Your choices are gene flow, genetic drift, mutation, or all are correct. Think about it for a second. Change in allele frequency due to chance. The only one that we talked about that was due to chance was genetic drift. Genetic drift just happens. It's very random. Okay, adaptive evolution. Let's talk about some adaptations here. Natural selection acts on heritable traits, which increase an organism's fitness. That fitness is survivability and fecundity, ability to survive in a particular environment, and the ability to reproduce. Unfavorable or harmful alleles are eliminated. So there's the idea of evolutionary fitness, or sometimes it's referred to as Darwinian fitness, where nature selects for individuals who make the greatest contribution to the gene pool. Now, natural selection can affect a population, uh, population variation in a number of ways. We're going to talk real briefly about stabilizing selection, directional selection, disruptive selection, and sexual selection, which we've already touched on. Okay, with regard to stabilizing selection, now we have to look at the um, idea of variation. Uh, we have to plot it out with, with the extremes on one end and the other, and then we have the average in the middle, right? Just like the bell curve, just like grades in school. So in stabilizing selection, natural selection favors the average phenotype. The example that your book uses and that I'll use here are a clutch of robin eggs. Now, the average clutch of robin eggs is four, four eggs. And what has been found here is that, for instance, if there are two eggs, then that's not that's not enough, um, there are not enough offspring, right? The, the chance of both of those offspring surviving is very small. In a clutch of four, chances of two surviving, pretty good. But in, cha in, the, in the case of two eggs, the chance of both surviving, not very good. And the idea here is that, that natural, that organisms want to produce and have survive as many of their offspring as possible. So in a clutch of four, maybe three will survive. Maybe they all will, but often one or a couple are lost. So there's more of a chance of 50% of these offspring surviving. 
that's the average. So in stabilizing selection, natural selection favors the average phenotype, which is four eggs. Over here, you might have two eggs. Not very good for survival. If if 50 percent of the if if on average 50 percent are lost, and over here you might have six eggs or eight eggs, right? And what happens there is the nest is overpopulated. The mother can't uh, afford to feed all of these babies, and so uh, most of them are not going to get fed, and most of them are going to die. So natural selection has favored four eggs for a clutch for a, a robin favors the average phenotype versus directional selection. So we're, here we have the extremes. On one end, you have the, the very dark moth. One end, you have the very light colored moth. So natural selection favors a phenotype on one end of the spectrum, right? And the example here is the peppered moth. Back in the when the Industrial Revolution started over in the old country in England, the plants, the industry was pumping out so much carbon, so much soot that the soot covered the trees in the forest. And the natural color um, of these peppered moths was this white. That's why we call them peppered, right? This um, is white peppered with these little dark specks, speckled. Now, as the trees get covered with soot, they turn dark. And as you might imagine, it would be easy for the main predator of these moths, which are birds, to pluck these guys off of those trunks, right? They're easy to see. So directional selection then selected for the darker colored moths, because now if you're a dark colored moth, you blend in with a bark and birds are less likely to see you versus your cousin over here who is still light colored and speckled and the bird is going to come along and pluck that one off. So directional selection favors one end of the spectrum. So the original population is the speckled moth or the peppered moth and after natural selection the selection here is the dark colored moth because they are the survivors. So that's directional selection, natural selection of one end of the spectrum or the other, depending on your environmental factors. We have disruptive selection. Now here's the sockeye salmon. Your, your book uses um, a hypothetical example of rabbits but here's a real example of sockeye salmon. Disruptive election, natural selection favors the extreme. So before where we saw the extreme peppered moth and the extreme on the other extreme, the dark colored moth. Directional selection favored the dark colored moth with regard to the, the soot covered trees. Here, natural selection is favoring the extreme. and um, is not favoring the average phenotype here. Okay, so in sockeye salmon, here we have these big guys here. Um, this is the average phenotype. This is the average sized sockeye salmon. In the normal situation, average size, these guys, right, the population wants to stabilize. There's your bell curve. Population wants to stabilize, and so the average sock sized sockeye salmon is selected for. Uh, the average size individual is selected for. And sockeye salmon, though, remember salmon are the fish that swim upstream to um, reproduce. These males are going to fertilize eggs upstream. Okay, so, but in disruptive selection, Selection is not going to favor the average size guy, but it's going to favor, first of all, the large phenotype. The large phenotype can, can get through, can knock these guys out of the way. These guys cannot compete for mates with these large sockeye salmon. So the large guys are going to get in there. So here we see, you can see it's 
dark, more darkly covered. So this is population after selection, favoring one extreme. But interestingly, if you're smaller than average, these guys cannot compete with the large guys. But these small guys can slip in kind of under the radar. And they can fertilize eggs along with the large guys. And as far as the eggs go, they don't care whose sperm they get. They just want to be fertilized, right? Um, external fertilization is what fish do. So females lay the eggs. Uh, the males squirt the sperm into the water. The sperm swim to the eggs, and fertilization occurs that way externally. So while these guys are fertilizing eggs over these guys, these guys are able to slip in again under the radar and release their sperm and fertilize eggs along with the large guys. So these guys have more of a selective advantage than the medium sized guys, than the average phenotype. And so this is natural selection over the median, natural selection of the extremes, the big guys and the little guys get selected for here in disruptive selection. So it, it disrupts it disrupts the norm. The norm is this medium-sized guy. The norm is the bell curve. Disruptive selection throws all of that out of the water, if you will, and selects for the large and the small. And then we have sexual selection, which I've already mentioned. Sexual selection. Um, here are mountain gorillas. You can see, first of all, the sexual dimorphism. Here's the big silverback male. Here's the female. The male is obviously, obviously much larger than the female. But, okay, so that's sexual dimorphism. But with regard to sexual selection, this, this guy, the bigger this guy is in the harem or uh, in the tribe of mountain gorillas, if he's bigger than all of the other males, guess what? He gets to mate first just because he's bigger, just because of his size, right? And so with regard to sexual selection the with mountain gorillas, the bigger the male, the more he gets to reproduce. And so natural selection here favors one gender over the other. So it favors the, big ma the biggest male over the others. And we've already talked about selection of the prettiest uh, tail feathers or the male with the prettiest, largest tail fan and the frog with the loudest, deepest call. Quick check. The average height of adult males in Belgium is 178.6 centimeters. That's about 5 feet, 10 and a half inches. This is, is an example of which type of selection? Choices are sexual selection, disruptive selection, directional selection, or stabilizing selection. Average height of adult males. So at first you might think, because it says males, that we're dealing with sexual selection. However, you have this word average over here. You know that uh, there is a type of selection, natural selection, that selects for the average phenotype, and that's going to be stabilizing selection. Okay. The last video here is from Teacher's Pet. It's types of natural selection. It talks very briefly. It's only like two and a half minutes long. Um, talks about disruptive selection, stabilizing selection, um, and it's worth you watching, only a couple minutes long. Preguntas, um, let me know. Message me, email me, use the inbox, Canvas inbox. Thank you, this is the end of chapter 19.